So we're getting to our first actual statistical test, uh, the single sample one-sided uh, t-test. And we start this with a recap of inferential statistics, a, a recap of conf confidence intervals, and a recap of statistical statements we can make. Um, because you actually already know how the one-sided t-test works. So if you understand standard errors, if you understand confidence intervals, um, you understand the t-test. It's just asking a slightly different question. So you can probably figure this out by yourself. And um, I mark this lecture with a star again because uh, this goes really to the heart of uh, statistics, how it works. So if you understand this, you almost understand all statistical techniques. The principle is always the same. So making the step from a t-test to an ANOVA, uh, this is really not very deep. So let's start uh, with a recap of inferential statistics. We start with a population, and um, so that's the total number of objects that we want to make inferences about. And that is usually in a black box. This population has a true mean and has a true standard deviation, uh, we, but we really don't know what that is unless we simulate it in R, right? So we can simulate it in R, then we know it, and we can use it to explore it. But in real life, uh, that is not something uh, that you'll ever know. Uh, so your population may be 10 billion trees in a particular ecoregion. Uh, nobody's going to measure this. So we really don't know what that is, and there's no way for us to uh, f truly find out what that is. So what we do instead is we take a sample and measure that. And this gives us unbiased estimates of the standard error and of the mean. So we figured that out. Uh, we can make this adjustment, uh, divide by the degree of freedom, which gives us estimates of this standard deviation and that mean that are not systematically over or underestimated. So what I've drawn here in blue should be the same as what I've drawn here in red. But it's, it's going to be somewhat off because it's just a random sample. And uh, the question is, how far is it off? So that is a missing piece of information that we usually need for decision making. And um, it depends on the sample size. So the more you sample, the better. But there really is no universal rule for what's the right amount of trees, what's the right amount of replication in an experiment, what's the correct sample size. So if somebody tries to give you advice here, so 30 is something that is often said, that's totally wrong. <laughs> so that, that, that is not how, how it works. Sometimes two is just fine. Uh, there is tons of studies out there that would be a success if we had one replication, so an N of two. So if your effect size are reasonably large, if your results are quite clear, N equals two is perfectly fine. So a, a lot of pilot studies that just go with N equals one, uh, they would actually be all right with N equals two. So keep that in mind. And, you know, I worked for a while in uh, genetics and, and tree breeding. In that case, 30 trees is ridiculously low. So you have enormous variances and you're after very small improvement. So if we can get 5% improvement on a trade, that's big money for forestry companies. But in order to detect those differences, you need huge sample sizes. So you, you need thousands of trees. So there's no rule um, what the right sample size is. What you usually get after a while working in a field is uh, what the correct, what a good sample size is for your particular field and for your particular question. So the question is also, also a key determinator. Sometimes being 90% sure or even 80% sure about something, that's plenty. Then I don't need a big sample size. And in other cases, I want to be 99.999% sure that I got something right. And then you do need very big sample sizes. So it's driven by the degree of certainty as well. So there are so many factors that go into this that it's not possible to give a rule for the correct sample size. So this is all based on experience and based on the question you're asking. And it can be the same study that asks different questions that require different uncertainties. So for example, um, we, we see, we're seeing it right now, right? So a vaccine efficiency test, that can be done with a you know, sample size of 1,000. But a vaccine safety test, so that's stage three, that needs to have 30,000 just because I need the high probabilities. I want to be very, very sure that the frequency of very, very severe side effects is very, very low. So that's where the big sample size comes in. Although it's the same study, uh, different sample sizes are required for different questions. 
Okay, so we want to know how far we are off that true population mean, how certain we can be about this, but there is no way for us uh, to figure this out. So if you just have that one sample, you, you need repeat studies, right? And so the brilliant thing about statistics is that we do the repeat studies, we imagine the repeat studies, right? So we found a way to estimate how the means would be distributed if we were to repeat the study. So if I draw these diagrams from now on, there are never any trees <laughs> in those distributions. So this is a distribution of imaginary means that can be estimated with this beautifully simple formula. And now we have all the pieces that we need to make inferences on what's going on in our black box, right? So we know that this distribution, this imaginary distribution of the means, um, is centered around the true mean. Then the second piece of information that we need is how wide that uh, distribution of the sample means is. So from that, we can calculate probabilities, right? Do you remember, distribution is just a probability for uh, any given value of a, a variable. So we can calculate the probabilities that this true mean falls into uh, a certain interval. So it's a, it's a bit of a reverse reasoning. So we can, we can think about this distribution here jumping around left and right and left and right. But, it, but it's very unlikely that it jumps all the way to the left here or all the way to the right. So that's why my means are uh, unlikely to have these uh, these extreme values here. And we know it jumps around this true mean. It's an unbiased estimate. Uh, we can calculate those probabilities that the true mean is really uh, captured. So that's what we do with a confidence interval calculation. And so we had the luxury of uh, simulating this whole process here in R. That was the end of the uh, video 5.2, I think, not 5.3. So we can actually do exactly the same steps as above. Uh, we can generate our um, black box here that we don't normally see. So we have a population of 100,000 trees, say. So you could put bigger numbers there, but it's not necessary. And it slows down the computer. Um, then next, we take the sample. So that would be the second distribution that I showed you above. Uh, we can we can estimate the mean and the standard deviation, and then last but last but not least, we can infer that distribution here. That's our standard error, uh, standard deviation of the means, and calculate our confidence interval based on this. And we've seen that this works, right? It works crazily reliably, even though each sample is different. My confidence interval uh, was right every time. I repeated this part uh, over and over, and I was right every time, right? So. Uh, that's really brilliant. Um, well, I should say I, I was right 95% of the time. So I know exactly what the degree of uncertainty of my statements is. So we can work with that. So to get to the uh, one-sided single sample t-test, um, we have to think a bit more about the statements that we make. So in the case of the confidence interval, what I was saying was I'm 95% sure that the true parameter, so my mean of 15, that I knew because I generated that in my simulation, is larger than 12.71 or smaller than 18.32. And, you know, that was correct. The 15s were sitting in between those two values. So this is what I preset. So I said I want a 95% confidence interval, and then I calculated those two values here. So if you do have such a predetermined probability that uh, you want, uh, that's also called an alpha level. So it's a predetermined alpha level. And what flows from this are these numbers here. And, and you've seen it. These are actually two questions that I ask separately. So I'm asking, is the true parameter larger than a particular value or smaller than a particular value? Those were two separate commands. If we go back here, this is the one, this is the other. So I'm really asking only one question at a time. Um, and then I combine those uh, to get the 95% confidence interval. Now, there is another version of this uh, where I flip what's predetermined. So what I can also ask, uh, if, I, if I have a particular interest in a particular threshold, for example, instead of 12.71, which I calculated, I'm really interested uh, in whether something performs better than uh, I don't know, 10 kilograms per hectare or any threshold that may be of uh, practical interest or commercial interest. 
So I, I can also make statements that go like this. The true parameter is larger than 10 with a 97.62% certainty. So I can set that side of the equation first and then calculate the p-value uh, that I predetermined in the other statement. So if you do that, so if you're asking this question slightly differently and reverse the order of that calculation, then you actually got a t-test. And so that threshold that I set here that can also be another mean, right? Then I have a two sample t-test or multiple means and I have an ANOVA, or I can ask also uh, whether one mean is different from another. And that's really not, not different than co combining the two statements here in the uh, confidence interval calculation. So I'm doing exactly the same thing here. I'm asking uh, it's either larger than another mean or smaller than another mean. And so that would give me the answer whether it's different from another mean. So these two bulleted sentences here, these are really the only kind of statements you make in statistics. And then you can combine them to make other derivative statements, but they're all based on, uh, on either that version or this version. So I call them version 1 and version 2. So all statistical statements confirm to version 1 or version 2. But you may wonder, hey, uh, you know, this seems unlikely. Um, I can ask completely different questions, right? So I can, for example, if I have a correlation, I can ask, is there a significant association between X and Y, right? And this does not seem like conforming uh, to those questions, but it does. So what you really do in a linear regression, and we'll cover this in more detail later, but uh, you may be familiar with this formula, Y equals BX plus A, and B is your slope. So if you go one unit to the right, you go B units up, and you have the intercept here, which is A. The, the statistical statement that you're making is actually a version 2 one and goes like this. The true slope is larger than 0 with 97% uh, certainty or smaller than 0 with 97% uh, certainty. And so those combined, if you can make that statement with enough certainty, then you would call that a significant correlation between those two variables. So it always boils down, regardless of whatever statistical test you use, uh, you can always boil it down to this version 1 or version 2 statement. OK, um, uh, let's do a confidence interval uh, calculation again. And I want you actually to do that by yourself. And once you know how to do this, uh, you will be able to do a t-test all by yourself and ask a slightly different question. This is, this is really just a recap, and I, uh, I actually have shown you this exact graph before. And what I'd like you to do is use that lab 2 data set, farm 1 variety A, those are just four numbers, and uh, calculate the 95% confidence interval for me. And do it in R, uh, so use the R functions that we covered in the previous videos. I'm giving you a couple of hints here. You can use this schematic here um, to figure out how to go about it. So all the information is contained in here. And so what we're ultimately after, we want a confidence interval in the original units. I want to know what's my 95% what's my confidence interval that captures the true mean with 95% probability in units of kilogram per hectare, so in my original units. And confidence interval calculations are really just unit conversions. So if I have a normal distribution, I can express this in original units, I can express it in z-scores or t-values, and I can also uh, express it in percentiles. So down here we have the zero percentile, here in the middle at the mean we have the 50th percentile, so 50% 50 of my observations are above, 50 below, and my maximum value is the 100th percentile. Um, so all we need to do is move between those scales in order to figure out our confidence interval. So we preset the p-value. That's what we decided in advance. So we don't want the 90th, 90% confidence interval. We want the 95th in this case. And that corresponds to a particular z-score or t-value. So how many standard errors am I above uh, the mean or am I below the mean for this particular percentile? So you, you can do this, you can get this with q-norm or qt. Uh, so q-norm applies if I have a sample size larger than 30 approximately, so then we don't really have to worry about t-distributions. But if uh, my sample size is small, just as in this example, uh, you would have to work with QT. So these numbers here, actually, this, this number is actually not right. Uh, don't use that. Um, so this would be for a sample size larger than uh, 30. Mm -hmm. And so once I'm here, once I've figured out from my percentile with the QNorm function um, what the Z-score or T-value is, then I can just uh, multiply 
by my standard deviations and at the mean, and I have my um, confidence intervals. So I do this on both sides. You actually only have to do it on one side and do plus minus uh, the other one. And that should also make sense. So if I'm one standard deviation above, then I have to multiply my Z score to get to the original units. Uh, but then since zero times the standard error is still zero, I still have to add the uh, mean to get uh, to the final value, to my final confidence interval. Um, so go ahead and try this out, work with those numbers, uh, do everything in R. It should be like uh, five lines. And once you have it, uh, then continue with the next video.